Among the most disturbing trends of the 21st century are increasing global inequality and stratification of wealth. French actress, writer, and humorist Audrey Vernon decided to do something about this using her talents. With the famous list of the world's wealthiest people from Forbes magazine as her inspiration, she created a one-woman show, How to Marry a Billionaire, that explores in comic fashion the contradictions of capitalism today. C'est joli. C'est joli, hein? C'est canon. Bonjour. Bonjour. Pas longtemps. Bon, ouais, je me marie, hein? D'accord. Bientôt. Bon, ok. Avec un milliardaire. Bon, ouais, c'est bien. C'est dingue, non? Ouais. <rire> c'est quoi comme marque? Il y a un peu toutes marques. Il y a huit marques en tout. D'accord. Vous vendez pas aux particuliers? Non. Dommage. On met en place des. Mais vous allez les trouver en boutique. D'accord. Et là, il va avoir un défilé Oui, il y a un défilé tout à l'heure. Il y a un défilé ce matin et cet après-midi. À 14h30, c'est ça Oui. On peut jeter un œil de loin Oui, mais vous n'êtes pas des pros D'accord. Vous n'êtes pas de Non, non. Tu si tu as le choix, là, maintenant, on fait un tour, laquelle tu prends Je crois que je prends. Ça linge C'est un peu cheap, quoi, pour un milliardaire, quand même, non non, elle est toute brodée. Tu trouves qu'elle fait cheap Ah ouais, moi je trouve. Hein. Je trouve. Hein. Non C'est quoi J'ai jamais vu des photos de filles qui se marient avec des milliardaires. Je, je, me, je pense que j'imagine que c'est plein de diamants. Euh, tu vois Non Ça dépend, ça dépend les. Puis parfois, tu sais, les filles elles se marient avec des milliardaires avant qu'elles deviennent milliardaires aussi. Hein. Ça, 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 arrive, ça. ça arrive, ça Ça arrive. C'est chic aussi de se marier en noir. Hein. Ça, tu vois, ça, j'aime bien. C'est chic, mais en même temps, ça fait un peu funéraille, non Ça dépend. Il des, y a, y a des, des pays où on ne se marie pas en blanc. Et C'est comme il y a des pays où on ne fait pas des mariages d'amour. En Inde, par exemple, ils ne font toujours pas des mariages d'amour. Ben, ça ne marche pas si mal. Un mariage de milliardaire, ce n'est pas un mariage d'amour. Disons-le franchement. Pense... La plupart du temps. Je pense que tu peux avoir un vrai coup de foot pour quelqu'un qui est 33e sur 7 milliards. J'aime bien, moi, j'aime bien quand il y a beaucoup de tulles comme ça. J'aime bien les trucs très. Ouais, très plein de tulles. Je trouve ça assez rigolo. Moi, je crois que les milliardaires, ils aiment bien. Ça dépend. Les milliardaires russes, c'est quand même un peu différent des milliardaires français. Les milliardaires français, c'est plus chic. On est en Dior, en Chanel. La, la fille de Lakshmi Mittal. Son mariage a coûté 55 millions d'euros, c'était en France. Donc c'était le mariage le plus cher de l'histoire de l'humanité. Pour vous donner un ordre d'idée. Toi, tu veux faire mieux 55 millions, c'est... Euh... Non, non, mais, ça... non, mais 55 millions, c'est pas mal déjà, je trouve, pour, euh, pour un mariage. Sur, euh, sur le corset et le thérapé. Vous voulez faire fabriquer où Vas-y. Vas-y, vas-y, ouais. Moi, je, je fais un spectacle qui s'appelle Comment épouser un milliardaire Ouais. Sur les inégalités, sur les chez les pauvres et tout. Et donc, du coup, j'achète tout le temps des robes de mariée. Mais vous faites quoi avec les robes Ben, je joue. Vous voulez pas les Non, non. Mais, mais une, elle me fait un an, quoi. Parce qu'après, au bout d'un moment, elle est. Là, j'ai mis la mienne à la machine là, là tout à l'heure. Et la robe, vous la mettez quoi en situation Vous faites quoi Je la mets au théâtre. Là quoi, vous avez une scène pour vous jouer le spectacle carrément en robe de mariée ouais. okay. J'en peux plus moi d'être en robe de mariée. Je crois que je viens de rencontrer le fabricant des robes que je porte depuis super longtemps. Parce qu'il fournit des robes pour Tati Mariage. Et c'est des robes Tati que j'ai. Donc si ça se trouve, je viens de rencontrer le le créateur de cette magnifique usine de fabrication de robes de mariée en Chine. Quand j'ai écrit le spectacle en 2008, c'était avant la crise, et tout le monde me disait genre « tu peux pas faire un spectacle sur l'économie, ça va intéresser personne » et tout ça. Puis après il y a eu la crise, et c'est là que j'ai réussi à trouver un, un, une salle. Donc le spectacle en fait il tourne depuis 2009. Au départ ce qui m'a inspiré c'était je, je voyais euh, de façon empirique, en fait, de mes yeux, je voyais l'explosion des inégalités. Euh, en, autour de 2009, 2010, j'ai commencé à avoir des, des gens qui fouillent dans les poubelles dans Paris, euh, mais pas forcément des, des, des mères de famille ou des retraités, par exemple, 
Ça, c'est quelque chose que je n'avais jamais vu avant et qui est vraiment apparu. Je trouve que la misère dans Paris commence vraiment à se voir, la misère des classes moyennes et l'insécurité des classes supérieures aussi. Ça, ça, c'est quelque chose qui se voit vraiment beaucoup. Donc, c'est pour ça que j'avais envie de faire un spectacle là-dessus. dernière fois que je monte sur une scène. Demain, je marie. Ce soir, c'est un petit peu mon enterrement de vie de jeune fille, en quelque sorte. Je vais vous donner tous mes tuyaux. Vous êtes beau. Vous êtes bien. J'épouse un milliardaire. Je suis contente. Est-ce que quelqu'un dans la salle gagne plus de 10 millions d'euros par an encore une salle de pauvres. Oh, c'est pas grave. On est pauvre, on est pauvre, mais on est heureux. Alors, un milliardaire, j'explique, parce que pour les pauvres, les sommes peuvent paraître un peu floues. Un milliardaire, c'est quelqu'un qui a 999 millions plus 1. Il y en a seulement 1226 dans le monde, c'est rien. Ce serait des animaux, ce serait une espèce protégée. C'est pour ça qu'on n'a pas le droit de les tuer pour leur fourrure hein, et d'en faire des sushis. En tête, l'homme le plus riche du monde, c'est Carlos Slim élu. En deuxième position, il y a Bill Gates et juste derrière Warren Buffett. C'est le PDG de Berkshire Hathaway, un fonds d'investissement. Il achète des actions pour les vendre. Lui, il n'a rien fabriqué, rien inventé et il a 50 milliards. J'adore, Après tout, pourquoi est-ce qu'on a le droit d'attaquer les hommes politiques Et pourquoi est-ce qu'on n'a pas le droit de montrer, le... de montrer les, les photos des milliardaires Et un truc qui est assez amusant, c'est que quand il y a des articles sur Amazon, sur euh, LVMH, Zara, etc., ils ne citent jamais le nom du propriétaire. Et ça, je trouve ça très bizarre. Je comprends pas pourquoi ils font ça. Parce que le moindre pauvre qui fait une connerie, il y a son nom dans tous les journaux et tout ça. Et quand il y a un article sur Amazon, il n'y a pas le nom de Jeff Bezos, qui est 19e fortune mondiale, qui est le propriétaire d'Amazon, et c'est à lui que profite le crime. Et, et dans les journaux, son nom n'est jamais imprimé. Comme si on avait peur de salir sa réputation. Pareil pour, euh, pour Zara. Quand il y a des articles sur les conditions de fabrication chez Zara, le nom d'Amancio Ortega n'est jamais prononcé. D'aller jouer dans les usines, c'est... C'est des émotions incroyables. Je ne l'ai pas fait tant que ça. Hein. J'y suis allée, j'ai dû jouer une dizaine de fois dans des endroits différents en lutte. J'ai dû faire 10 représentations dans des usines et j'en ai fait plus de 400 dans des théâtres. Et c'est vrai que, que, par exemple, quand je suis allée à Florence, je... ils m'ont emmenée dans le haut fourneau. Ils m'ont cachée dans la voiture avec ma robe de mariée et ils m'ont emmenée visiter le haut fourneau et je me suis promenée sur la robe, avec ma robe de mariée sur l'état de, de charbon. Et donc c'était marrant parce que quand je suis revenue au théâtre le soir, Ma robe de mariée était pleine du charbon de Florange et, et de jouer tout en sachant que ma robe était noire de charbon alors que je parle de Mittal, enfin, après c'est des tout petits détails, il n'y a que moi qui le sais, mais c'est vrai que quand je joue ça, ça donne une autre dimension à, à mon jeu. Bon après il n'y a vraiment que moi que ça intéresse, hein, mais... <rire> French artist Pierre Huyghe is determined to overthrow the gallery model. He envisions exhibition space as a world evolving according to its own rhythms. He goes beyond simple multimedia presentation to mix animals, machines, objects, and humans. Canapé visits his show at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art.
French artist Lily Renaud Douard is interested in breaking down the walls between the public and private space. Live through that. Her first solo museum exhibition in the United States at the New Museum presents an open bedroom installation. She includes a series of four new site-specific videos that reveal the artist as she moves and dances in the empty galleries. Canapé discusses the installation with curator Helga Christofferson. Lily is somebody we have uh, had seen uh, at various exhibitions in Europe, actually, and then uh, just noticed uh, her work and also was really interested in like the, the scope of her work. She works across so many media, uh, but with really kind of pertinent issues. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I thought that it would be really great to invite her to come here uh, and show her work here for the first time in New York. Lily was really happy about the space in this uh, this gallery and to many extents uh, the situation here where uh, along all of the gallery is a glass facade uh, that faces directly out to our lobby and the cafe and the bookshop uh, where lots of other things go on. Uh, that was somehow the ideal scenario uh, for Lily. Um, she has for a number of years worked with uh, constructing more intimate spaces, especially bedrooms. And she also thinks of this installation as a bedroom. Um, so, uh, and this, this creating, creating a bedroom and, and then say making the exhibition space into, into a domestic space, that transition is something that she has been very, uh, been very interested in. Um, and that, that also kind of raises the issues of what's private and what's, uh, what's public. And so that, that is also in this situation here, you, we're, we're in a space and as such we're in Lily's exhibition, but we're also part of, uh, we're also in a, in a public space. She is interested in, like, in liter literature specifically, um, like the literature that's part of this installation as well. Uh, it's uh, excerpts from a book by uh, the French writer uh, Guillaume Destan. Uh, it's a very diaristic um, book and really really t talks about his life and his, his experiences and his relationships and his sexual encounters and um, his uh, as part of part of his kind of uh, his life at the, in the 19th, uh, 1990s in Paris um, and so she's uh, she has this interest for something that's that's very revealing uh, something that's very honest uh, writers uh, who's who really um, dares to put themselves, uh, to open themselves and expose themselves to. Um, and I think that, that also relates to you know, her, herself exposing, she is exposing herself as well. She's always been, always been using body makeup, uh, either on performers that was instructed to cover themselves or others, and then on herself as well. Uh, so this is something that's been kind of going through uh, her interest in what happens to you when you uh, to a certain extent, like put on a put on a mask, uh, not in the sense that you hide yourself, but what happens when you when your body becomes just a body and not your body. This reference comes from a, a very famous piece by Bruce Nauman that's called Art Makeup, where he covers himself first in uh, white, then pink, then green, and then black. Uh, and that's a reference that she never really somehow explored. That was the foundation of her even looking to. Uh, her, her thoughts about covering her body and what it means to turn herself into a, a sculpture of sorts as well. Um, and then she decided to explore that reference here. She was very interested in the architecture of the building because we here have like these uh, boxes on top of each other. Uh, and she uh, was really kind of taken by the kind of the sequencing of that and thinking uh, that, that became somehow an invitation to make a sequence of works was really kind of a coordination task. She was, uh, she was performing on each of our floors uh, while those floors were in transition. So while the kind of the former exhibition were being broken down and the new one was set up. So she's not performing in any other artist's exhibition, but she's, um, she's performing on the floors while the visitors are otherwise not, uh, you know, not able to see that. And I think that's also another issue that gets to the question of the private and the public uh, and transparency as well. Normally here as an institution um, we, uh, we, you know, we prepare the exhibitions and once they're done we open them and the spaces are open to the public but here she actually somehow also reveals this institution in a moment, in a kind of a private moment let's say. Some personalities are so distinct that they define the place where they live. 
For many New Yorkers, the late Jean-Claude Baker was such a figure. His signature restaurant, Chez Josephine, is dedicated to his adopted mother, the great African-American entertainer Josephine Baker, whose biography he also wrote. Canapé revisits an interview with its friend Jean-Claude. What people don't know is that the legendary Josephine Baker, she got the name Baker by her second husband, who she married when she was 15 years of age, the first one she married when she was 13, but we are celebrating, to my heart, Frida MacDonald. That's where she was born, on June the 3rd, 1906, in St. Louis, Missouri. Josephine Baker grew up in the ghetto of St. Louis. St. Louis was an important jazz town. It was right up the river from New Orleans. It was a kind of a feeding ground for rural blacks from the south, from Mississippi and Alabama. About 1899, 1900 was when black dancing first surfaced into white, chic jazz dancing with the cakewalk. Josephine was a master of the cakewalk. Josephine had all those kinds of dancing that we could maybe all call jazz dance or eccentric dance from the streets, from, the, from her childhood. And she mished them all together just naturally by growing up where she did. Josephine represented this melange of, of exciting things. Le jazz hot, even though she wasn't technically a jazz musician. Um, the excitement of um, the new Negro, you know. It was America that had um, black musicians, uh, this vision of um, black life um, that was modern and right there in the city streets of America. Josephine left St. Louis when she was 15 years old with Bob Russell's company and Clara Smith, who was a fabulous blues singer. And then when she's 16, she started in Shuffle Along, very important. Shuffle Along is the first black show who brought back black entertainment to the mainstream of white America. And right away, she was an eccentric chorus girl. She did her own routine. She didn't follow the choreography and the routine of the choreographer of the mission. And on the opening night, uh, Hugh Blake, who was in New York, called the director, uh, Loki Roberts, was a friend of mine. He said, oh, what the opening night? She said, everything went well, but for that crazy Josephine Baker. Why? Well, she did a routine, uh, which was not in the show, and I fired her. And uh, UB Black said, how was the reaction of the white audience? And she said, you won't believe it. They love it. He said, put her back in. <laughs> Joyfine came first to New York uh, with Chocolat Dandis, which would follow Shuffle Along, big star, opening night, the New York Times reviewers, wonderful. And of course, in those days, she had no choice. When you were a person of color, you had to live in Harlem. There were nowhere else where they wanted you. The mixture in the connotations of the figure and the jazz style was not something that America could have really digested at that time in uh, the racial texture of our country. France embraced her. So of course she embraced France, Europe, and her talent. All the performers were very light-skinned. There were only two darker people, Josephine Baker and Maud De Forest, the soubrette. The soubrette means the singer. And the director of the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées we were very worried because the French would have thought they had Spanish girls dancing there. So they needed color. And Josephine was paired with Joe Alex, a young man from Africa. And typically of the French and of show business, where you can do whatever you want in show business. The last number was a dance de sauvage, the dance of the savage. Half of the 2,000 people of the theater, those precious bourgeois with their diamond and all of that, left the theater screaming that black American and jazz would destroy the white civilization. And it was a big brouhaha. And then at the end of the number, Gertrude Stein, Picasso, Man Ray, everybody was crowned Josephine, the first black sex symbol of the last century. When you read reviews uh, of her work, uh, you know, you see, and when you see some of the art too, you know, you see that. Um, 
you know, French audiences were overwhelmed that there was no way um, again with the excitement about black people and eros and you know the fantasies about their sexual capacities in the 20s for her not also to be um, even when that's not exactly what she was giving you but she was always playing with it there was no way for her not to in people's imaginations you know <laughs> take on many sexual myths Many things were projected on her as a person of color in Paris in the 20s and in New York in the 20s even more. And she seemed to accept all the projections and put them to use. Today it would be horribly, horribly offensive to put a black person in a skirt of bananas. It's saying you came from the trees and the monkeys. She submitted to the skirt of bananas and because the skirt of bananas was a very bold visual symbol, very graphic, it worked. It's adorable. It's wonderful, a skirt of bananas. It's sexy. It's sexual. And it's funny. And she made it all those things. Josephine Baker's three films, One Silent, Two Talkies, they are fascinating to watch. Uh, they are also frustrating. And in that, as with a lot of old films, um, you know, in that lies some of the fascination. Every one uses the same um, format through some elaborate plot that always involves uh, an attractive Frenchman whom she will not be allowed to, to marry, whose love will not be returned. Um, the love, she will love him, he will not love her in return. Nevertheless, the compensation in all three is indeed what the compensation in Josephine's life uh, was. She becomes a result, given the opportunity to become the toast of Paris. In Sirene des Tropiques, it's a silent film, and you have all the conventions that Hollywood had invented for silent film heroines. She climbs a tree, she gets down from a tree, she frees a cat from a well, she does all these things that are very physical, more physical even than they have to be. The unusual part is that she's beautiful. I'm not sure she would have been filmed beautifully in an American film. She's filmed with a beautiful scarf on her head, big, big earrings, but her little face, it's kind of heart-shaped, it's wonderful. You just, you just keep staring at her. She's papy too. She's a espiègle, wonderful, uh, no choreography. And uh, everybody seems to be dated in that film, but she uh, could be coming out yesterday or this morning. Josephine Papitou is leaving her native island, and she's to go to France, to Paris, to civilization. But of course, there is a price to pay, even if it's only the price of the ticket for the boat. And she's wonderful, uh, despite the silence movie we see her expression and the way she's trying to pay her ticket and propose of course a gris gris. Josephine is acting a little bit exaggerated, uh, like the part demanded, but uh, she's, she's wonderful, she's a clown. She reminds you a little bit of Charlotte Chaplin. Zuzu is my favorite of the three films because it seems to have been closest to, it was closest to Josephine's heart, that's been said, but it's closest to giving her enough space to be who she really was, which was unique. She was a unique thing. She was an American poor black who had become a French symbol of elegance. And although Zuzu doesn't really have dancing, it has a great, uh, big scale music hall number, Il n'y a qu'un homme à Paris. She's backed by a whole lot of chorus people and she's in a satin dress. She comes down and she takes up a position with the chorus in back and she is a dancer singing. It's beautiful. <laughs> I opened the door in my little bistro chez Josephine on 42nd Street, 
And people come very seriously and said to me, is Josephine cooking tonight? I must say the first time I was shocked, amused, and sad. But the same, who is Josephine Baker? So I would answer them, is she cooking tonight? Yes, in spirit. Josephine Baker was a patchwork. The beautiful patchwork you put over a bed. The one they started to sew together during slavery time. And today it's even fashionable, young people do that again. It's so difficult to say who Josephine Baker was. The talent of Josephine Baker is that she was whoever you wanted her to be. And that's why it's very difficult to answer with one single word, who was Josephine Baker? Unique is not enough. Talented is not enough. Demented is not enough. But like the title of my book, Josephine with a hungry heart. I like that. Thank you.